could use it on any night he wants. Well, good morning. morning. It's great to be here uh, to sing praises to the Lord, to fellowship together, and uh, thank you, Daryl, for a great package of songs. It's like you read my sermon. Some really good stuff to kind of prime the pump. So let's get to it. Have you ever felt like uh, you have come to the end of your rope? You know, something uh, disastrous has taken place or at least disturbing, and there's nothing you can do to fix it on your own. Now, it might be a health issue or a relationship problem. Maybe you can't dig your way out of a financial hole. Whatever it is, overwhelming circumstances can leave us desperate for help. Back in August, I preached on a passage from 1 Kings 17, <clears throat> the story of Elijah and a widow of Zarephath who was in desperate need. She had a little oil and a little flour and was basically going to starve if that didn't get fixed. This morning, we're going to be in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. 2 Kings 4, 1 to 7, so you can turn there in preparation for that. Um, this time, the story features a different prophet, Elisha, who uh, succeeded Elijah, and another desperate widow. And when you get into the books of Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings, you're in a part of the Hebrew Bible called the former prophets. And unlike um, the latter prophets, which is more familiar to us, Isaiah to Malachi, you don't find um, a whole bunch of prophetic speeches warning about judgment because of rebellion. What you find is the history of Israel, basically, from their conquest of the promised land right up to their captivity in Babylon. <clears throat> and it's usually presented in narrative or story form. And uh, there's a, a bit of a, a theme to these things. Um, it's that God helps those who walk faithfully with him. That's what we usually see in the former prophets. Those who fear God and walk in step with what the prophets are asking of the people generally get blessed, and those who do not, well, life just doesn't end real well for them. And the stories in the former prophets, uh, we see that they're intentionally highlighting God's care and provision for his people, and in response to that, the people have the responsibility to live for and to rely on God, and that timeless purpose, of course, still benefits God's people if we live for him and rely on him. And that was certainly the case for the widow in this story. So it's just seven verses. It's a short little story. Let's get to it. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to her, How can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, well, except a little oil. Elijah said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. She left him and afterwards shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied, there is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. Well, let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this uh, little story we find in your word. Thank you for the privilege of being able to gather as a church family uh, to sing praises to you, to worship, uh, to contemplate who you are and what you do, and that's been uh, presented really well in the songs that we've sung already. You're a dependable, faithful God who provides for us. And we pray as we go through this little story that you have placed in your word for us, that you would soften our hearts, open our ears um, to hear and receive what the Spirit wants to do in us and to be sensitive, Father, to uh, conviction, correction, encouragement, whatever you're going to bring to us as individuals this morning. And we invite you to do that in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. You know, as you look at this story, it's, it's pretty clear. She is at the end of her rope. She's desperate for help, and so she cried out to Elisha. Now, the Hebrew word cried out usually is found in a, um, it appears in a moment of distress 
anxiety, uh, desperation. Sometimes they, they cry out to assemble an army for battle. It's usually someone who's feeling a little bit overwhelmed. I mean, this woman has lost her husband, her provider, the father of her sons, so she's brokenhearted. I mean, that would be a big enough burden to bear in itself if the rest of her life was okay, but it's not. Along with losing her husband, she's about to lose two young sons, and we know they're young because the Hebrew word is yalad. It's, it's not a growing adult. Two young sons to a creditor because of a debt that her husband owed. And the narrator tells her that her husband was a man from the company of the prophets, literally the sons of the prophets. It's not referring to a family connection. It's talking about a distinct group of people, a defined group, and they appear to be prophets in training, sort of, disciples of Elijah originally and now Elisha. In fact, Elisha was recruited by Elijah and became his attendant. So this is who these guys are. And Elisha obviously um, knew the widow's husband because it tells us that he was Elijah's servant. And the widow added, and you know that he revered the Lord. So the dead prophet in training is a godly guy, and I think we can assume the same is likely true of his wife. And her hopeless situation had absolutely nothing to do with any wrongdoing on their part. They just borrowed some money, maybe to buy a, another acre or two of land or whatever it might have been. And with her husband now dead, the creditor's calling in his loan. And in Leviticus 25, verses 39 and 40, um, we see that the poor in the land had the option of selling themselves into indentured slavery, basically, or servitude to a wealthy person in order to just survive or maybe sometimes to pay for a loan. And hey, if you owed the guy, he'd make sure you did it, and that's what she's facing here. And you do that, you work for them with the only collateral you have, and that's physical labor, and that's all, the only way this guy's going to get his money is if her two sons go to work for him. Now that person who has put themselves in servitude to the wealthy person can only stay in that position until the next jubilee. Now a jubilee comes every 49 years. You know, if, uh, if we were three quarters of the way through it, it's not so bad. You know, you're gone for a few years, but if one had just ended, this widow could be facing decades without her two boys. That's quite a burden. So she's facing not only the emotional pain of the death of her husband and the loss of her boys and worrying about how they're going to be treated, but as a woman in a patriarchal culture, she absolutely needed her two sons in order to have a decent future. So she cried out to Elisha. She's in a desperate, heartbreaking situation, and she's probably wondering, why is this happening to me? Do we ever have that attitude? Sometimes, maybe, why is this happening? Especially if, like this man and his family, we've been faithfully serving the Lord, and suddenly it seems like the floor falls out from under you. Why? Why is it happening? And sometimes our struggle comes as a result of a stupid choice that we made. We sinned, and the Lord sends a hardship simply to get our attention and to draw us back to himself. Sometimes he puts us in the furnace so to speak, to burn away some things that hide the image of Christ in us. He wants us to be more godly, more dependent on him. And sometimes, I think God allows us to go through hardships simply to show himself powerful to meet our needs. If everything's easy-peasy, God doesn't get the opportunity to show how powerful he is. And often what looks like an obstacle in our eyes turns out to be an opportunity when it's placed in God's hands and he makes it sufficient, not just to solve our problem, but to grow us in faith. Whatever this woman thought about her circumstance, she went to the right place. Now, maybe her sons were the only family. She had no other immediate family around her, or maybe um, just because she was a widow of a godly man, she naturally went to Elijah, who in verse 7 is called the man of God. Her husband faithfully served with Elisha, and so they had um, a sort of a family connection. They were all prophets, 
and they had a shared faith in God. She went to the right place for help. Where do we go in difficulties? You know, she went to a distinct group of people, well, Elijah, but he represented a whole family. I think this little story maybe tells us that church family should be the natural place we go to for earthly help. God has designed the church to be that, uh, to be in need of care from others and to minister to needs that we see. And when we are in really desperate situations like this widow is, then we need divine help. I'm pretty sure this dead prophet probably told his wife about some of the miracles that Elisha had performed. And I think she went to him expecting God to work through him on her behalf. She went to the right place. And she came to Elijah because she believed God takes care of those who faithfully serve him. God takes care of those who faithfully serve Serve him. It's likely why she reminded Elijah that husband or, or that her husband revered the Lord. You know he revered the Lord. You know, God doesn't owe us a thing for our faithful service, not a thing. And yet, Psalm 68 5 says, God is a father to the fatherless, a defender of the widows. Psalm 18 25 says, To the faithful, you show yourself faithful. And this woman was trusting that for herself. And we should too. We should too. Now James 4, 2 says, you do not have because you do not ask. We can't charge the woman with that because she went directly to Elijah immediately. Some people don't. Sometimes even Christians don't go for the help that they need. What is it that keeps some from asking for help? in a dire situation. Usually it's pride or self-sufficiency or the feeling I don't want to appear that I'm weak or can't handle this on my own. It wasn't true of this widow. She knew she couldn't handle things on her own. And we see that in her words in response to Elisha's question, what can I do to help you? What do you have in your house? You can hear the insufficiency she's aware of in her words. She says, there's nothing there at all except a little oil. She knew exactly how helpless she was on her own to solve her problem. The little she had seemed completely useless to her. Just a little oil, at least in her hands. Folks, God has a purpose for absolutely everything he allows into our lives. And he does that, I think, sometimes just to bring us to the end of our rope to encourage greater dependence on him. As I said a bit earlier, if life is so easy, you can just cruise through it. It doesn't seem much need to go to God. So sometimes he puts some bumps in the road that wake us up and draw us back to him. I think the first thing we can learn in this story is this. Difficulties reveal our deficiency and our need for divine help. Difficulties reveal our deficiency and our need for divine help. They're designed to do that. In order to be drawn to the fullness of God to get what we need, we first have to realize how empty we are on our own. And it's usually from the bottom of the barrel that we get that picture most clearly. Now, this widow's debt put her in need of God's help, and Elijah's instructions, too, are pointed the way to get that help. All she had was a little oil. In the NASB, it says a jar of oil. Some translations might have a flask of oil. The Hebrew word is a souk, a souk. And this is the only place in Scripture that it appears, is here. And the root word souk means to anoint. So it's possible that all she had was a little jar that you might use for anointing oil or maybe for putting something into your pan when you're making your bagels. Just a little wee bit of oil, not enough on its own. So Elijah tells her to go to all of her neighbors and ask for empty jars. Vessels would be a better word here. The NIV has jars. The, the Hebrew word basically is a catch-all word that can be anything from weapons to tools to instruments of some kind. The context determines what it is. So in this case, vessels would be anything that would hold oil. Jars, pots, pails, barrels, and he says to her, don't ask for just a few. And if she was puzzled by those instructions, it was only until she realized she was going to be filling 
all of these containers from this tiny little jar of oil she had in her house. Why was she asked to include all of her neighbors? Well, maybe because in a, an impoverished country like Israel, much of Israel was, one house wouldn't have very many containers. So she might have to go to all of them just to get enough oil to actually pay off the debt that she had. Or maybe it was so the whole town would know what she was trusting God to do for her. Or maybe it was because God wanted all of the people around her to play a part in the blessing that she would receive and then to marvel together at his generous, miraculous provision. Because there'd likely be some skeptics in the crowd as she went door to door asking for containers. Um, this was a time of apostasy. People had drifted away from God and most of them were doubtful of miracles. So this would be a huge thing. You know, difficulties serve the purpose of demonstrating our need for God. I think there's a second lesson here for the church in this go to all your neighbors. God wants the whole church family involved in caring for his people. God wants the whole church family involved in caring for his people. It's the way he has designed things. He wants us to need each other and to minister to each other. And Paul makes that clear in Galatians 6, 10. He says, as you have opportunity, do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. It's how God has designed the church, whether it's to give physical help to a problem or a spiritual provision of collective prayer and encouragement as you gather together to encourage each other. The more people involved, the greater the unity and the greater the glory God receives as all those people marvel together at his supply. Seeing a miracle would bless her neighbors too. And folks, asking others for help can be a blessing to them because we do need each other. And when the widow looked at her situation, I'm thinking about all she saw was an insurmountable mountain of debt. But as I said before, sometimes what looks like an obstacle in our eyes turns out to be an opportunity in God's hands to grow us in faith. She only had a little, but God can turn that into abundance. And that's a principle for us to live by. Little is much when God is in it. You know, the Gaithers used to have a song by that title, Little is Much When God is in It. You know, I think God is interested not so much in what we have as in what we are willing to do with what we have, whether that is time or money or talents. God wants to bless us, and he wants to make us a blessing to others. And sometimes that's involving them in delivering us from a need. And for that to happen, we need to be ready to use what we have, ready to place it into God's hands, and trust him to multiply it. To multiply it. You know, God can make much out of absolutely nothing. All you have to do is look out the window. One of the songs talked about creation and creator. All of that came from nothing. Ex nihilo, out of nothing God made everything. He doesn't need anything that we have. He can make much out of Next to nothing. He used a staff in Moses' hands to part the Red Sea and to bring water from a rock that nourished a whole nation. You know, five loaves of bread and two fish from a little boy put in the hands of Jesus provided a meal for 5,000 men plus women and children. God can make much out of nothing. We just have to give him what we have and trust him to multiply it. Now, God could have solved the widow's problem by just producing a huge bag of gold on her kitchen table. But then it wouldn't have required anything from her. And God probably wouldn't have got the glory because people might think she robbed someone else. Instead, Elijah made her exercise obedient faith by going to all of her neighbors who might laugh at her, call her foolish for what she was expecting God to do, fill all those containers with oil. Now, God gets the glory when we trust him to provide what we cannot possibly get on our own. You know, Elijah didn't tell her to go get a specific number of containers. He didn't say, go get 30 big containers. He didn't say that. 
he just told her, don't ask for a few. Or I think in other words, get as many as you believe God will fill. Just keep going door to door until you can get as many as you think God will fill. And the number that she brought, I think, was an expression of her faith. Maybe she got every single container that was in that little village. And the oil flowed as long as there were containers to fill. It stopped when there were none. I think it reminds us that, you know, God's work in our life is not limited by the size of what we have for Him to use, a little oil, but by the size of our faith in His grace and ability to multiply what we bring to Him for Him to make it sufficient. And the Philippians 4.19 says, My God will meet all your needs according to His glorious riches in Christ. And folks, that is a storehouse that is inexhaustible. So what He supplies depends on our needs, and I think to a large degree on how big we believe. James 4.2 says, You do not have because you do not ask. And maybe sometimes, friends, we don't ask big enough because we're afraid God won't answer. Well, don't pray for healing for cancer because that hardly ever happens. No, we need to pray big and continue to do that. Or maybe sometimes we don't ask because we asked for something in the past and uh, we didn't receive it. And so we don't want to, you know, sort of put God on the barrel again and we don't know what God's will is in every situation. We don't. But if we don't get what we ask for, we need to trust God to always know what is best. There's a reason we don't get stuff. And then to pray with that in mind. We do not have because we do not ask. Let's not fail to ask. The next verse, James 4, 3 says, When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasure. Sometimes we pray with a want in mind instead of a need, and maybe we don't even think about God's glory at the time. Now, I'm guessing if this widow had spotted a nice retirement home on the Mediterranean and decided to go get every container she could find in the whole promised land, the oil still would have quit flowing when there was enough to address the situation that she found herself in. God promises to meet our need, not our greed. So health, wealth, and prosperity gospels, preachers keep that in mind. We don't just get anything that we ask for. But this woman got what she asked for because she was obediently trusting the Lord to provide what she could not provide herself. Now there's some instruction here that Elisha gives it seems a little bit odd. She was told in verse 4 that after she had all of these empty containers, she was to go into her house with her boys, shut the door behind them. And verse 5 explicitly tells us that after leaving Elisha, that is what she did. So the narrator tells us that again. First, Elijah says, do this, and then she says, yeah, she did this. What's that about? It must be significant because the narrator repeats it. And there's no explanation, so we can only speculate why. But maybe it has something to do with privacy and nosy neighbors. But we know that doesn't fit well because they would all know what she was doing because they wouldn't hand over their precious containers without an explanation of why she needed it. So they already knew, and it would be a blessing to them to actually see that miracle unfold, especially in a time of apostasy when people thought that God was probably inactive. It was a little like Jesus' command, maybe, this closed door about prayer in Matthew 6, 6, where he says, when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. So maybe it's just about you and God alone, where you have an undistracted focus on Him and on absolutely nothing else. You know, the narrator also makes a point of telling us in verse 5 that the widow left Elijah, as I just mentioned, and verse 7, that after the miraculous provision of oil, she went to the man of God and told him what had happened. So he ain't in the house. 
He's nowhere near it. And it seems to the narrator to be important that we know that Elijah was not in the house when the miracle happened and nobody was coming and going. The door was locked. Maybe the closed door was to prove there was no outside help other than God. There was no sleight of hand by Elisha. She had nothing in the house but a little oil and a whole bunch of containers. And when the day was done, she had who knows how many containers overflowing with oil. The only explanation can be a miracle from God. And maybe the point we take from this is that all we need to be is alone with God, trusting in His provision, and He'll multiply or enhance whatever we give to Him in a time of need. Now, this story is about God's gracious provision, and I think the central message is this. God gives above and beyond to those who trust in Him. God gives above and beyond to those who trust in Him. Folks, our Lord knows our situation way better than we do, and He often provides more than what we've actually asked for. This widow, what she had in mind was getting enough oil that she could pay off her debt and keep her boys from slavery. Verse 7 tells us that it accomplished that. He says, sell the oil, but it was more. He said, you can live on what's left. There was so much oil, so much more than what she needed to solve her problem that you could live for who knows how many years. You know, Ephesians 3.20 says, God is able to do immeasurably more than all you ask or imagine according to his power that is at work in us. I think it's telling us that all God needs is our willingness to be involved and bring what we have and faith to believe that he's going to multiply it. You know, our amazing God makes much out of next to nothing if we will just give it to him. And he doesn't do that because we deserve it, but because God responds to our faith in him with gracious provision. And I think this little story is a great entry point for the gospel. God meeting a desperate need we could never meet on our own. And folks, without him, we are in a desperate situation. Like this widow, we all are facing a debt that is far beyond anything we could ever begin to pay on our own. Romans 3.23 tells us, all have sinned and fall short. That's the debt. We fall short of the glory of God. We fall short of the absolutely perfect righteousness He requires to be with us, for us to be with Him in heaven. We don't have enough righteousness. And that shortfall is a debt that we could never work off in a million jubilees, in a million lifetimes of our own effort, we could never pay off that debt. Isaiah 64, 6 tells us that our righteous acts are like filthy rags. They're useless to God. The very best we can ever be is so far short, it's laughable. Our debt of sin has to be paid. A holy God cannot leave sin unpunished. Somebody has to pay the price, and the only acceptable payment appears to be death. As Romans 6, 23 says, the wages of sin, what we deserve for our sin, is death. So there we are. We're all on death row. It's a hopeless situation. Either we pay the price of eternal separation from God in hell when we face Him in judgment, or somehow, because that sin hasn't been paid for, somehow we become righteous enough to escape that penalty. It is a hopeless situation, folks, because on our own, we don't even have a little jar of righteousness. We have nothing for him to multiply. And, of course, that's why Jesus came. That's why he came. Only his death on the cross in our place could clear that debt by crediting our sinful lives with his perfect righteousness far beyond anything a little jar could even become in a million years. Perfect righteousness. There's a spiritual exchange that goes on here, 
And I, I've mentioned 2 Corinthians 5.21 numerous times, but it's got to be one of my favorite verses in Scripture. Speaking of Jesus, Paul says, God made him who had no sin to be sin or to be a sin offering in our place that we might become the righteousness of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in or through Christ Jesus our Lord. And the only thing we can do in this whole process is exercise faith in his provision. And frankly, God initiates and brings about the whole process of salvation apart from us. Ephesians 2.8 says, you have been saved by grace. By, it's by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourself, it is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. We are hopelessly dead without God's intervening gift of life. And folks, like the widow, every last one of us needs to recognize how utterly hopeless we are on our own and cry out like the widow to the only one who can supply what we cannot provide ourselves. Jesus came to pay a debt he did not owe because he graciously recognized we owe a debt we can never pay in a whole lifetime. It's not without God's saving provision that credits us with Christ's righteousness. And if you're here this morning and you haven't already done so, cry out to him. Romans 10, 13 promises that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Put your faith in Jesus. God will multiply that little bit of faith into his abundant righteousness that clears a death penalty debt. And not just that, it also gives eternal life, a new life that starts right away with peace and joy because a debt is fully paid and you have been rescued from slavery to sin. And you have all the rest of eternity to live off that freedom that he has provided. You know, the story of the widow's oil reminds us that God gives above and beyond to those who trust in him. We see it every day. We get far more than we deserve, often far more than we have asked for. And this morning, if you belong to him through faith in Jesus, rejoice in knowing that he always knows our needs. He will always meet our needs and multiply whatever we give to him in faith. Let's give him all we have. And if you're here this morning and you're not yet one of his, that is a problem that only he can solve. You can't get better. There's no bank account big enough for you to pitch in X number of dollars of righteousness to make it better. Cry out to the one who does immeasurably more than all we ask. Or imagine, and 2 Corinthians 5.17 will be true for you. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ through faith, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. Let him change your life, make you new, and move you from being overwhelmed to overflowing. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your grace, your mercy, to rescue undeserving sinners. Lord, we don't deserve a good thing. You are a good, good Father. You are amazing. We need you all the time, Lord. We need each other because you work through us to help others. Lord, I pray as we mull over this little passage today and think about this gracious provision that it would spark something in each of us to reach out to you more often to depend on you more fully and to work to bring about the things that those around us need as well. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your mercy and goodness. Thank you for giving above and beyond. And we invite you to show yourself powerful to that end in our lives this week. And we ask it in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.